Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We start with Monday Night Football. All right, can we please quit paying these mediocre quarterbacks like they're franchise quarterbacks? Mm. Please. That's my takeaway from Minnesota quarterback Kirk Cousins falling to 0-9 on Monday Night Football last night. Cousins and the Vikings handed Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, the NFC North, falling 23-10 at home. Cousins was terrible. He completed half of his 31 passes for 122 yards, one TD, and one interception. Big game, big bust. Kirk Cousins is a fourth-round quarterback. That's what he is. That's what he'll always be. Same as Dak Prescott. Cousins and Dak can quarterback Super Bowl-winning teams. Same as Brad Johnson and Jeff Hosteller. You don't have to be a first-round pick to quarterback a Super Bowl team. Hell, you can be a late pick and develop into Tom Brady or Joe Montana. But you can't develop Kirk Cousins and Dak Prescott into Brady and Montana. It's not going to happen. They're not franchise quarterbacks. They don't have the arm talent, the know-how, or quite frankly, the balls to be elite. They're solid NFL starters, and that's how they should be paid. They're a small cut above Andy Dalton, the longtime starter in Cincinnati, and a small cut below Jimmy Garoppolo and Carson Wentz, young guys with the potential to reach franchise status. But Cousins is being paid $28 million a year by the Vikings. The Washington Redskins wasted two franchise tag seasons and salaries on Cousins, hoping he would turn the corner and prove to be more than a solid starter. Let's stop the madness. I was against Cousins getting paid in Washington, and I didn't like the contract Minnesota gave him. I had the same reservations about Los Angeles' Jared Goff, another overpaid, solid NFL starter. Conventional wisdom says it's smart to waste huge salaries on solid NFL quarterbacks. Why? That money could be spent on great linebackers, terrific linemen, outstanding tight ends, big play safeties, hell, kickers. Why is the escalation of mediocre QB salaries seen as being inevitable as the fall of top running back salaries? Todd Gurley's contract is a cautionary tale. Why isn't Kirk Cousins or Golf's? We act like there's a law that if a quarterback holds his starting position for three or four consecutive years, he must be paid as a franchise quarterback. If a quarterback is the reason you win games, pay him like a franchise player. Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, you can't pay those guys enough. Overpay for Drew Brees and Tom Brady. But that's it. There are six franchise quarterbacks in the NFL. There are three guys, Wentz, Garoppolo, and Deshaun Watson, with a chance to be franchise quarterbacks. Everybody else needs to be paid 15 to 20 million a year and give the extra cash to the Bobby Wagner, Stephon Gilmore, Travis Kelsey's of the world. It beats blowing it on Cousins and Dak. All right, joining the desk now are Fox Sports NFL analyst LeVar Arrington and Bucky Brooks. Marcellus, I'll start with you. Please do. Is Kirk Cousins a franchise quarterback? Yes, he is a franchise quarterback. Did you watch last night? Did you? Yes. Did you? And did it remind you of something? Did it remind me of Aaron Rodgers when he came to California, both of those games? Oh, it did, kind of. Did it remind me of Tom Brady when he was going against Cincinnati? A little bit, itty-bitty. But I understand they don't have the same equity and resume, so I'm not going there. But what you're describing as a franchise quarterback, you're actually conflating into Hall of Fame quarterbacks. All of the guys you named are future Hall of Famers or on a trajectory to being a Hall of Famer. But there's another tier which is between, let's say, an all-pro status or Pro Bowl status and a guy that the franchise can sell hope and hope that they can win with. That is the criteria for a franchise quarterback. So if you look at Kirk Cousins, what is he? The leader of a 10-5 ball club. And you're talking about last night. With one arm behind his back without his top two running backs, he went out there and lost the ball game once again on Monday night. But if you look at Kirk Cousins in totality, he is a guy that you can hang hopes on that he can win and hopefully get you into the postseason and make a run. So for your criteria, Hall of Fame quarterback, 
then obviously you're not going to respect his, his body of work. But he is a franchise quarterback. No, I, I love your definition. Okay, appreciate that. He's a hope quarterback. You're right. Mm. And you don't pay a hope quarterback like a franchise quarterback. Oh, really? Rich Gannon, <laughs> late move. No, no, mm -hmm. he was a franchise quarterback he, in Oakland. Not at that age. I don't care. And again, <laughs> pay him on hope. But don't pay him like a franchise. Oh, man. I'll take it. <laughs> What's I'll take it because this, this is the one, one instance where I'm going to agree with Jason Whitley. Ooh. I'm going to agree with him because I've always believed that the quarterback pay scale has been out of line. Here's the deal. You pay quarterbacks that can elevate your team on the strength of their right arm, you pay those guys their tier one money. So when you talk about Lamar Jackson being in there, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady forever, those guys are worthy. If they can't elevate the team, if they need all the pieces around them to be correct, then you can't pay them 30 plus million dollars. That has always typically been the really? standard that, that I've gone. No, because why am I paying you franchise money when you can't elevate the franchise and you need all the assistance? Elevate it to what level is the conversation? Because uh, outside I was saying, of Brady. Last night at home with the division on the oh, line. Oh, so we're talking about regular season wins. Team. Well, I'm just talking about doing your job elevating oh. the team. Well, we keep putting Brady in the conversation with Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers and others. Those guys have one Super Bowl. And you know why they only have one Super Bowl? Because they don't have all the pieces around them at certain times. Ooh, Tom Brady didn't always have all the pieces exactly. around Exactly. So if we're going to say franchise quarterback and put Brady's name in it, everybody else is something different. Oh, it got quiet. No. What? No, 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 no. <laughs> Brady? You just, you changed the definition to winning Super Bowls. Bucky's talking about elevating your team on a consistent basis. Yeah, yes. And so, last night So we count. should call it elite. So let's just say the elites. So it's only a handful of elites. The elites are the top 10%. So we'll say the elites. So the Pat Mahomes, that crew, we'll put those guys up there. But there is a group of guys who their contract comes up and we're paying them like they're guys that can elevate that. He didn't and elevate Washington? Thing. No. no. Yes, he did. Yes, he Thank you. Did y'all remember Washington before, Kirk yes, Cousins? I, I, he was, I, do, I do. He was stabilizing that franchise. He did. You know what he, you know what he stabilized? That's elevated. elevated. He, That's he, elevated. he stabilized him as a 500 quarterback. That's what I'm paying for. I'm paying for average. I'm just telling you, he did stabilize the team. Oh, okay, and, this and cool. while I will say, no, he's not a franchise quarterback, I will disagree in saying that he does have the potential to be. I think he does check off a lot of boxes. You can't undervalue, and I know you respect this, you cannot undervalue the character and the leadership of, of a guy that's in that lead role. Kirk Cousins He's a checks leadership those, quarterback there, not I, a franchise. I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, take a I'll pay him leadership money. money. I'll take a leadership It ain't franchise money. When you look at the money, the money is based upon what the <laughs> economics of the position is, is required. And let's change the They're economics using of the that, position. Well, but we can't base that off of Kirk Cousins. You got to base that off of what these franchises are paying that position. It's the position that's dictating the, the and money. And I'm not, saying we need to look at it differently. Yeah, the position well, used to pay the running backs the most in the NFL. Pay, it pay, doesn't anymore. The, pay, pay that's the still players. a different that's still a different conversation. You're moving the goalposts and distracting the conversation here. Kirk Cousins has the ability to be a franchise oh, quarterback. God. And until he gets there, don't pay him like but one. But the economics of the position says if you have a defense like the Vikings have, and they've gone as far as they've gone in the in the playoffs before getting him. I made that mistake before, I won't do it again. Mm. You still are looking at what possibilities are there for this team by putting him in that position, and they paid for what they thought they were getting. Now, if he isn't that yet, he isn't that yet. But does he have the capabilities? He certainly has the capabilities. It's just amazing that people forget that the Washington Redskins were 3-13 and 13 before Kirk Cousins got there. And he took them all the way mm. to yeah. nine. He got there at the same time record. as RG3. Yeah. But he, yeah, was, yeah, he, was, he was, was a backup. He was a backup. He was a backup. He was a backup. backup. I'm talking about when he hit the field, yeah. uh, you want to see the record go? Four wins, nine wins, eight wins. Average. Uh, yeah, average. It went downhill. But where are you average. starting from? You're just average. Where are you starting average, from? Yeah. You're starting from three wins. Go look at his record against oh. winning teams. Oh, I know that. Good. I know that. His average. record yeah, against winning teams. Respect. His record in spotlight games. My, oh, and not, that's not a franchise guy. He's an average guy. Why can't he? That's, that's, that's what he is. That's way too strong. That's what he is. He's, He's an average guy with a nice personality. He's 32. There's only 32 jobs out there where you could be a starting quarterback. Among those 32, he's relatively average. He falls right Right there, 16, he's above, he's he's above a, the average. He's not a top 10 quarterback. He's above the average. He's Come not on. a top 10. He's right in the middle of the pack. Come mm. on now. He's mm. average. But we're paying him like this. So the whole thing is the scale is out of whack. Because with the quarterbacks, any quarterback is getting 
big time money. They're the highest paid guys on the team. We've all sat in locker rooms and we've looked across there and we've seen the average quarterback make more than everybody else. And we know that he's not the reason that the team is winning or losing. And so if teams would just make it like it was at, at the park, I got first pick. Who do I want? Give me Marcellus. Instead of saying, hey, the quarterback, the guy that takes the snap every play is the most valuable guy. It's wrong. But, we all know but you know why? You know why? Because all the quarterbacks are on TV talking about how important the quarterback position is. Everybody talks about how important the quarterback is. No, no, no. Are. No, 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 no. Uh -oh. Everybody you does. do. Don't throw everybody in. Oh, you're part of everybody. You're having a different yep. conversation than the one no, you are. No, oh, the system's no. this way, so it must be that's this way. That's what he just said. That's no, no, what no, Bucky no. just said. No, that's what you're saying. No. Me and Bucky are saying, I'm saying they need to evaluate Ooh. these guys based off their contribution to the team because Bucky just made a hell of a point. Yeah. Nick Foles making $23 million a year. Is he the best, player? Right. Is he the best right. player in Jacksonville? It's the economics that's driving the position. You guys mm. are putting it on the player's mm. name. Mm. Y'all putting it on the player's name. It's the economics that surrounds the position, and I'm going to stop Let's talk about those same else. economics. Go ahead, when, take it. Go when we ahead. talk about the cap that has went up 10 plus million each mm -hmm. year right. for mm -hmm. the last six years, which will justify the money he makes, but what will justify in the court of public opinion will be the numbers. He is the quarterback of a 10 win franchise, possibly 11. Mm. He is the fourth rated quarterback in terms of quarterback passer rating. Mm -hmm. He is fifth in touchdowns, but he's not top 10. So where do you want to go to show he's not top 10 if his performances and the most important column, win-loss column, shows he's a top 10 quarterback? Ooh, okay, so, so I'm I got I'm a great. computer right here. No, no, Let's I'm, do I'm it. great, because what's going to happen is their argument is going to flip then when we begin to talk about Dak Prescott. Because then everything that you're talking about is with passing yards and quarterback wins That's and all that. Look and at so, Willard, then it, me. so then it's going to flip because then not for he, me. he is right behind Tom Brady with the win since 2016 and all that other stuff. Yeah. So what happens is when we've made the quarterback out to be the end-all, be-all, we end up overpaying for the position as opposed to evaluating guys strictly on their talent, performance, and production, and contribution That's to the squad. That's how it's always been, Bucky. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't right. make it right. Hey, that, that is that, how it always been. That doesn't make it right, though. Hey, LeVar. All right, LeVar. Bucky Le Kaepernick. LeVar. LeVar. <laughs> <laughs> LeVar. Come on. I, I mean, honest to goodness, we yes. have to go deeper than that's how it's always been. Because but, if we, if, uh, let me finish. Uh -oh, if we just kept with that's the way it's always been, we wouldn't be on this show. Not all four of us. See? We wouldn't right. be on this show. <laughs> Not none of us. So again, I don't care that that's the way it's always been. What we're having a conversation about is what's right. And to me, if I'm an NFL player in these locker rooms and I'm playing these other positions, and I'm going, damn. No, you're not. This dude can keep going out here with his average but performance, and he's going to get this model. major, Ten? major uh, pay raise. Nick Foles is going to make 23. I'm going to make 10 million, even though I'm a Pro Bowl, All Tim Pro. Tim Bradford made blah, blah. 20 million last that, year. I'm sorry, if like, I'm an like, NFL player, I'm like, hold this on, is crazy. Ezekiel Elliott is making a gang of money and only got 13, 14 this million. Year? Hold on, let's, let's go. If I'm in that locker room with Ezekiel, I'm like, you ain't earning that dough this year. If I'm in the locker room with Todd Gurley, who has no games over 100 yards this year, mm -hmm. you ain't earning that dough. So why we keep picking that the warts and oh, but, quarterback but, but I'm okay, but and I'm not okay the warts with that, in other positions? But, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with also holding people to task. Like, look. Right. Compensation and production have to match. And his production actually matter. does. But, but, it's but, just his narrative. It? Here's my Fourth point. Fourth and quarterback passer rating? Okay, so, touchdowns? So, so, okay, so then we're going to put Jameis up there. Jameis got like 5,000 yards. Jameis to get his money. I mean, we're going to talk about him money? being a $30 million. And he should, do. <laughs> And he should. That's the economics of the position. But the position is driven by those economics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And whether it's been that way all okay. along or not, I, it's, I, I just want the NFL's business I just want you to understand. America used to have a business model. Okay. Th that, can call ha that had us in a position. Well, the economics of your position pays you nothing. And so we might as well just keep it that way because these people are valued at a higher rate than you. There are a lot of people and that so, live that again, way. Again, all I'm saying is with the NFL, if I'm an NFL player that plays any other position, the quarterback, I'm like, why do we keep sending all the money to the quarterbacks? How come more of it can't come because our way? Because the game it's is the reason around Ezekiel Elliott making $14 million. The reason why he's not catching much, he, he's making $14 million. If they were paying him $35 like they're about to pay Dak, he would be catching major And heat. he would have to justify that by touching the ball every single play, which he can never do at his position. Most important position and a position that, let's be real, we've all played different positions in the locker room. 
You can focus singularly on just your position and ball out in the NFL, except one. And it's quarterback. Everybody else, if you're a D-tackle, man, I don't, what they doing back in the back end? Don't even know. I don't even know. What a quarterback has to know. All 11 guys, including himself. And then he has to know what the defense is doing in disguise and then projecting that to what it's going to be in reality. Come on, man. That's, That's his job no, we got no. That's his job description. That's that his ain't job. Around. Bucky Brooks is back. And we're joined now by Fox NFL analyst TJ Husmanzada. Time now for a big story. Let's return to Minnesota where Aaron Rodgers and company had no problem taking care of Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings last night to clinch the NFC North. Green Bay is now 12-3, and three, and while they haven't gotten as much attention as other top teams in the NFC, like the Saints and the 49ers, they can actually clinch home field advantage with a win over Detroit and a 49ers loss to the Seahawks on Sunday. All right, the question here is, are the Packers, will they be the team to beat if they have home field advantage. Oh, absolutely. If you talk about their home field record right now being 7-1, and one, and then you introduce a team that can travel, which is play defense and run the football, but they get to stay at home and introduce the real 12th man, which are the elements. Oh, those cold, snowy conditions with a team that can run the football and play defense like they can is going to be tough. In the NFC, that's wide open because you fear no team at the top. You don't fear San Francisco. You don't fear New Orleans. You don't fear Seattle. I, you don't fear Minnesota. So if you're Green Bay, you say bring them all through here where we've only had one loss this year playing our style of football. Mm. And then the extra condiment of Aaron Rodgers going back to vintage Aaron Rodgers instead of playing within the system Aaron Rodgers, which I commend. But if he goes out there and has his individual performance with this team, Oh, they're going to be tough to beat. Absolutely not. They're, they won't be the team to beat. And, and I say that when they played the 49ers earlier this year, they lost 37-8. Mm -hmm. They wasn't even a game. They got mm -hmm. destroyed. And earlier in the year. It was and, and San Fran. It, and that defense not the same anymore. Even if, I know the defense isn't the same for the Packers either because the Packers have the 18th ranked defense. Mm -hmm. They play well in spurts, but they're, they're not consistent. You're not a consistent defense. And you can, the way they played last night against Minnesota, if they could do that every week, then they would be the team to beat. But if they're 18th rank, obviously they can't. So if you're asking me, I believe the Saints can go in there and beat them, and I believe the 49ers can go in there and beat them. Yeah, I think this is a weird team for the Green Bay Packers because their record suggests that they're one team, but I don't think they're that. Because I don't know what their signature win is. Mm -hmm. What is Last the big night. win? The Minnesota Vikings, that's the signature win? In conference, I mean, we're talking about division The sixth-seeded team is the signature win that you have? Yeah, I, I think, Cowboy yeah I mean, like, like so, so I just think, when you're looking at the Green Bay Packers, I think they have to play a certain way. The thing that makes them dangerous is number 12 can go off at any time. But if you ask me if they're a better team than the San Francisco 49ers, no. They're not better than the New Orleans Saints, no. I think they're a team that could just as easily be a one-and-done and out team than a team that goes all the way. I think right now on Christmas Eve, they're better than the 49ers because I think the 49ers have backed up. Mm. Jimmy G's still loose with the football, and San Francisco's defense has backed up. The best team in the NFC, in my opinion, is the New Orleans Saints. Sean Payton, Drew Brees, their defense on a mission. However, if the Dome team has to go to Lambeau Field right. in January, that scares me and concerns me as someone that thinks the Saints are the best team in the NFC. So home field advantage, I think, would be critical. Drew Brees, at his age, out in those elements, mm. That's a tough scenario. Yeah, the 49ers have certainly come back to the pack. Look, they're still, mm -hmm. I think, a tier two team in the NFC, but not with the early start. We knew the record was going to change after mm -hmm. week eight. It did. And they have responded less than compared to their record. So if you look at what the signature win is, beating KC, okay, whatever you want to say about Patrick that. Patrick Mahomes. I know. Mahomes. I didn't play. Did play. Pat Mahomes I didn't play. Okay. I'm just saying, you said signature <laughs> wins. You beat Minnesota twice in KC. I know what you're saying. Okay, but TJ, Mr. The 18th in defense. Oh, no, not really. They're ninth in scoring defense. That matters more than how many yards I gave up, how many points we're giving up. They're seventh in takeaways. So this is a defense that is stingy at the right times and makes sure that they stop you once you get into the red zone. And they're great on running the ball, especially first down. So they're going to have a lot of second and short. With Aaron Rodgers sitting there at home and it's freezing, maybe snowing. Oh, that's tough to beat. The thing, like, the 49ers defense obviously hasn't played as great. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it, hmm. they're still the second ranked defense in the league. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The sixth ranked offense in the league. And so for me, you can play bad all you want. But when the numbers say your defense is a second ranked defense and your offense is a sixth ranked offense, 
the numbers speak for themselves. And they're winning games. You're not going to go undefeated. To beat a six-reign offense, the sec that's the team to beat. It doesn't matter how they play. As long as you win the game, that's the team to TJ. beat. TJ. No, no, get him, please. Uh, CJ, you're here because of your expertise on football. Yeah. Not your analysis of numbers. Now. And so, again, when we talk about the 49ers, <laughs> I'm talking about what we've seen here lately from their defense, from Jimmy Garoppolo. And look, all your opinions but are still, still valid. they're still winning games. Oh. Like, you, you're not every, you're deep. Oh. It's a reason why when you don't play well, okay, the offense will take care of the defense and vice versa. That's what happens. Like, I played on a team in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. 2006. We led the league in forcing turnovers on defense. When the playoffs come, you're not going to force as many turnovers. Mm -hmm. you, you can't rely on that. You have to play stout defense. You can't rely on your defense getting turnovers. You got to play stout defense, stop guys, three and out. You, you can't rely on turnovers. That doesn't happen. I just don't know, if they're, I don't know if they can consistently play this style that they're playing because they've been able to get away with whipping up on bad teams with their defense, heavy pressure. But when teams run it right at them, like the San Francisco 49ers did early in the year. They had a tough time stopping it. I just don't know if those teams, New Orleans and San Francisco, if they see that they have to travel to Green Bay, if they're scared to go up to Green Bay and deal Who with Who you like, team. though? I like Kyle, Shan Kyle Shanahan or Matt LaFleur? Mm. Oh, I, I, Kyle Shanahan. Well, I like Kyle Shanahan, but luckily he won't be putting on any pads. Matt LaFleur. Coming up. Hey. That's so L.A. Whitlock and Wally, LeVar Arrington, and T.J. Husmanzada are back. Let's move to Colin Kaepernick, who still isn't any closer to realizing his dream of returning to the NFL. But it looks like the former quarterback has still somehow managed to have a Merry Christmas anyway with his new signature shoe from Nike reportedly selling out just minutes after it was released yesterday. All right, the question here is, uh, are the new Kaepernick shoes, Nike signature shoes, is this a good look for Colin Kaepernick? Oh, man. I am torn. I would say it's a bad look because of the road travel. Like, one, off top, I am happy for anybody that has their own signature shoe. Yep. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're Marbury in China, to all the guys who've tried and some who have, uh, you know I'm a big supporter of the Triple B, big baller brand. I am in support of someone doing that in free enterprise for profit. But when you use the cause to gain the popularity and the martyrdom, and to, one, resurrect your Nike deal, which was about to be off the table before this level of popularity. And then, more importantly, use your workout that was supposed to be for skills instead of for marketing and profit, where he first introduced these shoes, to get to this. That's when I have an issue with it. Um, look, are all the proceeds going to the cause? Because the cause certainly got you to the point where you have this signature shoe. Yeah, I, I need to have that answer. I need to know a lot more of the detail of what goes into this and what comes from this to what got you in this position, which is the cause. Mm -hmm. I say it's a good look because of what you just said. I, I kind of looked into it, and it's two retailers are going to donate a portion of the proceeds to two of the causes that he supports. And Undisclosed amount. Yeah, okay. and so we, we, I don't know the amount, and... Yeah. He's in this position because he has people, obviously a ton of people that support him. That's why the shoes sold out as fast as they did. But if a portion of the proceeds are gonna go to a cause that he supports, then of course it's a good look. He's not playing anymore. He has to be a businessman. He has to earn a living. And for that, I'm all for it. I think it's a great look. I think it's a bad look. And I think it just further drives home the point of a selfish approach. Something that maybe didn't start off as being selfish, it, it was selfless to begin with, has now turned into a solidification of it's not about social injustices, it's about Kaepernick's agenda. I don't know where the strategy with him and Nike has began or begun, where it starts, where it finishes, but no one likes to play a fool. You know, it, uh, you might have liked Cleflo Dollar or a couple other people mm. out there that, that have preached gospel and, and have created movement and, and have solicited funds and have sold a, a product uh, to further what it is that their agenda is. But I just look at this and it, it almost seems like you're exploiting the very thing that the purity of why you became such a, a polarizing figure and someone that represented hope um, it, it just seems like there's too much of a, an agenda connected to what's going on now. The, the whole thing, I, I think it's a bad look. I, I, I can't stand it. I can't stand the, I'm fighting the power, but 
I'm doing it on behalf of Nike, one of the largest global corporations on the planet. Nike is worth twice the amount of the NBA and the NFL combined. Mm -hmm. They generate far more money than the NFL and NBA. They are a global entity that profits off of slave labor in Asia. Mm -hmm. Where is that and, and, and Colin Kaepernick, again, is fighting the power on behalf of Nike. Nike's bigger than the NFL, bigger than the NBA, and somehow people are being sold the belief that he's fighting the power. He's working on behalf of the power at its highest level by branding himself as some kind of freedom fighter for justice and equality when all he really is is a brand. And, the whole, and again, why I think it's a bad look, I think other, any other athlete that perhaps authentically wants to take a stand for some cause that's controversial and polarizing will now look just like another Colin Kaepernick because this is, I've said it from the outset and I stand on it, it's always been about building a brand for Colin Kaepernick. That dude was at his happiest when he was making Beats by Dre commercials and he was the coolest thing going in football. And then once he lost his job and became a second or third tier quarterback in the NFL, he threw a tantrum and then it spiraled into this whole, I'm going to build a brand as a martyr. And now he's playing it to the bus and tap dancing for Nike. It's mm. bad luck. It's a disingenuous road. Disingenuous. Uh, disingenuous road. Um, things come to mind like, oh, now I know why you were dead set on filming and televising that workout to the world. Nike probably had them strings say, hey, man, we got these shoes that you're going to wear at this workout that's going to be part of this launch campaign. Be dead set on making sure that that's part of this marketing, not for skills, but for brand. Mm. One, that makes me think. I question it, Kaepernick. You can ho holler back at me if you got a different answer. All the missed, missed opportunities, messed up opportunities, tweets, racist owners, blah, 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 Players Coalition saying, why is Kaepernick so difficult? All I say is the Players Coalition was able to extract $90 million from the owners. I wonder if these shoes are going to be able to do it. Because if it's about, like you said, some of the proceeds going to the cause, the Players Coalition was sitting there saying, we got $90 million directly for the cause. Why would you not take that? I know why you won't. Because it's about you. It's about you flipping the cause to coin for your own self-gain while you're going out there and patronizing everyone's sensibilities because everyone is going to be endeared by the cause. So I just look at the whole situation, man, and just see fraud about a lot of the elements. And when he has no response to that, I get tired of people defending someone who won't even defend themselves. You could finance a presidential election. No, you couldn't. Why not? It could With get what? you going. It could get, get you, you going. going. Not fine. Uh, oh yeah, you're, they you're spending talking, billions of dollars to be and, president. And, and they probably and they could probably approach with with Nike being a part of what Kaepernick is doing. You could probably approach the numbers that could finance a presidential race. Yeah. So if you're talking Cabinet about putting day. some money here yeah. in this community center, saying this, we'll put a couple dollars here, we'll donate. No, if you're talking about you truly a freedom fighter and you working with a company that makes and generates the type of money that Nike generates, show us. I want to see who y'all putting in and putting out there to go on Capitol Hill. Who's going to go in into to the nation's capital and start talking about all of these social injustices? When I start seeing that intensity connected to that with the dollar connected to it, then I'm okay with it. That's not going to But happen. it's a hustle. He's this won. is a hustle. When he started this, <laughs> this is a hustle. I, and he he probably won't admit it. He didn't understand the magnitude and the gravity of where it was going. Right. It was unplanned obviously. Yeah. But when you give your own money, which he did, and I don't, I, I'm assuming this is not going to be a lot of money that's being donated. Right. But he's doing something. And that's, you can't. TJ, my, I, 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 I hate the standard of, well, he's doing something. Because that's a very low bar. No, no. We have a very low bar of what we ask. But there's a lot of people, people that aren't me. doing and anything. That's why, that's why he has there, the support. But, but no, there's a oh, lot that's of That's why he has the support. But again, there's a lot of people 
incapable of making that kind of huge impact. True. Because again, all you can really do is start with the man in the mirror and control your actions and your behavior. And I give all praise to any individual, no matter how poor or wealthy, that's doing what they can individually. But when you become wealthy, in, in my opinion, to whom much is given, much is expected. This dude is wealthy, has a large platform. The, the standard has to be higher. Well, he's doing something. Well, you know what? My little cousin, Josh, I, that's a nice standard so for him. But you for, should do more than what you benefit from it. If that's what you're basing it off of. No, I'm asking. If, if, right? if you're basing what you're doing off of the, the thought process and the ideology of what it is that he, he has built his, he did not build this reputation, this brand off of being a, a football player, or Super Bowl champ or MVP. He's built it off of, off of a Trayvon Martin, off of a Mike Brown. He's built it off of tragic situations that have happened between interactions with the police and regular pe uh, pedestrian civilians walking around. If you are basing what you are able to do off of that belief and it's a foolish following. It's a foolish following. I think that's super dangerous. Nobody likes playing the fool. So if I am generating these sales off of this product, then yes, just like the church, if you paying your tithe and, and I'm coming to church and I'm coming for Jesus and I'm going to give this this tenth because I go to church. But I see you pulling up in a 55 an AMG kit and then all your kids look good. Hair is cut. But my hair is undone. My kid's hair is undone, but I'm sitting in this pew trying to get Jesus. You got to justify what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think that this is the situation that Colin Kaepernick has found himself in. Yeah, man, he put himself in this position because of his voice, because of his platform for his election to be this poster child for the cause. So when that comes to play, the, responsi the responsibility is great. Uh, I got a couple things to say. One. No matter who you are, you can give. It's called the three T's. Time, talent, treasure. You figure out what you have, everyone has one of those three. Mm -hmm. So figure that out, one. Two, I get tired of the whole narrative of police brutality is what's destroying our community. At <laughs> most, by the numbers, you can say it's the sixth leading cause of us. At most, and they say that's even a stretch. But you know what top five is? Accidental deaths, including drownings, heart disease, cancer, homicide, and you talk about suicide. And we pick top, we skip top five, go to six, so we can sell something. Mm. And we're selling something mm -hmm. that is agitating not only those who we encounter in the police force, which a lot of them are us, but more importantly, it puts us, it puts our emotional state in a place of trigger so that we go out there and we that close to the edge because we believe in the ghost on, in that blue uniform. I just get mad when all of that culminates into you putting out some damn shoes and saying, what, am I safer in the streets? I, do you think That's he thought, crazy. but do you am think he thought... Am I safer in the streets? When it started, I'm going to put shoes out? Oh, no, no. Like am, am, am I safer in the streets with a Kaepernick shoe? But there's still an agenda. That's it's, the thing about that's it, That's the thing. It's called, there's an agenda it's attached called, to yeah, that. Here's, here, we, we're out of time, TJ, but here's what I think. And I, I said this at the outset. At the very beginning of this, it was always about Kaepernick. Yes. And so whatever spawns out of that and what has is the shoe deal. And the... Again, that's still all about Kaepernick. Did he know it was going to lead to a shoe deal? No. Did he think it was going to lead to something good for Kaepernick and his brand and being a celebrity and being able to profit off of being this martyr who allegedly stood up for his people? Yes, he did. I don't like it or respect it. All right, welcome back. With Lock and Wiley, LeVar Arrington's back with us. We're joined now by Fox NBA analyst Jim Jackson. Time now for Darnell's question of the day. All right, take it away, homeboy. Yes, sir, let's move to the NBA where some players and fans haven't been in the holiday spirit this week. Yesterday, Kyle Lowry got into it with a Patriots fan who reportedly told him to stop whining. And Isaiah Thomas actually just got suspended two games for going into the stands to deal with a 76ers fan over the weekend. It seems like players are getting into it with fans more than ever. I want to ask you guys, do you think players are being too sensitive? Yes, I do, but you all expected that. I'm an old fuddy-duddy. Mm, uh, get, off, get off my lawn. Yeah, get off my lawn. Yeah, I think they're being way too sensitive. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say they're dealing with conditions that none of us dealt with in our playing careers or obviously us being up here talking as broadcaster. Um, they're all first-generation social media. Now, why is that coming to play? <laughs> when we played, 
All you had to do was ignore your doorbell when the neighbor came by with a begging ass cousins <laughs> trying to get autographed. <laughs> and then that Sunday, you checked the paper or that highlight show, <laughs> and it was like five channels. And that was it. So we weren't inundated with negativity. Now, they're embarrassed. They have their missteps for millions, billions to watch, to meme, to laugh at. So when they walk into the arena, when they walk into the stadium, they're not like us. We were empty almost. I ignored all my neighbors. I hate neighbors, tell you the truth. My alarm going off, police come <laughs> get it. I don't need you over here ever, because I know what that comes with. But now, when you walk into the stadium on full, and then you see somebody do something, don't push me, because I'm <laughs> close to the edge. And social media got these dudes on edge. So what I'm seeing right now is not sensitivity. We all have a reserve tank. Theirs is just getting filled up before they even step into the arena. I'm going to say it is overly sensitive. You still got to be able to deal with the fanatic, which makes the fan. But I'm going to go a little step further with your social media uh, mm. example, because I think that this is what's playing a major part from this perspective is the desensif uh, desensification of the fan to the player. The barrier of entry has changed, all right? There is no real reverence when I see, oh, my gosh, like, there's Jim Jackson right there. Oh, there's Marcellus Wiley. Like, you see them out, mm. but there is no real contact. There's no, like, I know who he is. I know what he's got going on. I know everything about no what's mystery, going on, anyway. right? There's no <laughs> mystery. So whenever these guys are on Twitter and Instagram doing all these different things, those fans can hit us up right, right now. Right. Boom. Bam. In between breaks, this, that, and the other. Uh -huh. So there is no, that level of respect or reverence or even fear or intimidation, it doesn't exist. And, and now mm -hmm. these athletes have to deal with that barrier not being there anymore. Well, let me take it a step further that you took. Mm. It's, yes, they are more sensitive, but young people in general are more sensitive in today's world. So this, it's a microcosm of what's going on in society with social media, okay, especially driving that. But if you look at the NBA in general, we've had instances of this happening before. Okay, and when I was in the league in 95, Vernon Maxwell went up into the stands in Portland, okay, w with a fan and punched him in the face. Now, the fan said he didn't say anything, but at the time, Vernon said his wife had an um, abortion or it, she lost her baby, and the fan said something. He went up in there, okay? We had it Malice in the Palace in 2004, okay? Now we've had it here. Mm. So what I think happens now is, especially with young fans, they feel they have a voice, and that's in society. Mm. It's not just in the sports arena. They feel they can say whatever they want and get away with it. Now, players, like, I remember when I was playing this, I, I played up in Seattle. Fans said something, I went off. Now, I didn't go in the stands, but I was frustrated at the time. Okay, we were losing, and he kept running off at the mouth, and I said something. So it's not anything new to the industry, but we're, we're able to see it a lot more right now in real time and what it is because of what's going on in, in, in society. You know what's a little bit different for basketball players is the intimacy level as mm, well. Mm -hmm. You can put your feet on the court. Like, you don't have that amount of access on in a football stadium. Or interaction. Right? So, that or, interaction or hockey or baseball, really. Right? really. Yeah, yeah, they have a glass up in hockey. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little dangerous for basketball. Y'all have all given me something to think about, Marcellus, and I'm usually obsessed about social media, but you made me think about this social media aspect of it that I hadn't considered in terms of these guys are on edge. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because of their addiction and our addiction to social media, mm -hmm. and there's less patience and tolerance and the attacks all now seem far more personal mm -hmm. in the arena because the attacks on social media are often very personal. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so you, when you hear those voices now, it triggers you back to things you've read over social media that are very personal. But, but I, I will say this to the athletes, they have to be careful here. You're making millions of dollars because of the fanaticism. And fanaticism leads to people being extra. The, the, the people in that arena are fanatics and they're gonna say some things. You gotta remember the money you're making. And when I saw the quote from Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas saying, you know, he was protecting his dignity. I'm like, how does some jackass in the stands mm. have any control over your dignity? Mm. None. No, if, here's the thing before you go. Oh yeah. As I don't agree with going in the stands, yeah. but here's my thing. Here's where you take the power back. You go right to an usher 
or somebody in there that's what and I say, say, this is what you say and get them out. Now, yes. as frustrating as it can be at times, depending on what that person says, the power now lies within you to get them out of there. Because the minute you cross that threshold and go into the stands, but you, something going to happen to you. But I think with most, and I'm sorry we're out of time here, mm -hmm. but with most NBA arenas, to me, there's only a handful of sections that are really in shouting distance. Right. And they should have ushers hire five people to police that and run the people out of the ring so the players don't even have to get involved. Joined again by LeVar Arrington and Jim Jackson. Time now for the most fearless discussion of the day. All right, yesterday, ESPN's Jeremy Fowler published a story detailing the dilemma facing exiled All-Pro receiver Antonio Brown. The story paints a troubling set of circumstances that could prevent Brown from ever returning to the NFL. Fowler's reporting suggests Brown's abilities as a football player allowed him to escape the consequences of bad behavior since childhood, and that in recent months, Brown has sought counseling to correct his self-destructive behavior. Fowler's piece is thorough and well worth reading. It confirmed my belief that Brown is the Todd Bridges of football, mm -hmm. a child star ruined by the fame, fortune, and privilege of modern American sports. The NFL is no different from Different Strokes, the TV show that made Bridges, Gary Coleman, and Dana Plato wealthy and famous. All three of those child stars eventually spiraled out of control in their personal lives. Wealth, fame, and privilege showered on young people creates delusion, dysfunction, and antisocial behavior. We've seen this scenario play out with Hollywood child stars for decades. The phenomenon is now starting to play out in professional sports. Modern American professional sports leagues are nothing more than TV shows. The NFL is the most successful show in the history of television. The actors in the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, the PGA Tour, and the fight game are now much bigger stars than traditional TV stars of yesteryear and today. We should not be surprised that Antonio Brown is meeting the same fate as Lindsay Lohan and the cast of Different Strokes. Fame is a drug worse than crack cocaine. When fame is laced with performance pressure and a mammoth contract, the same reaction is to do what Dave Chappelle did, escape to Africa. A.B. is not taking the same route. He's falling deeper and deeper into social media abyss. The ESPN story said A.B.'s 2017 $68 million contract extension was a turning point. Fowler wrote, quote, that's when some friends and ex-teammates say the superstar behavior became more frequent. The distractions unavoidable, the ability to hold time commitments more flimsy. Brown's brother Desmond said, all the fame and money can get to your head, I guess. Like many athletes blessed with unique God-given physical talent, Brown, according to one source in Fowler's story, sees himself as a business mogul. This is the real delusion of athletic fame and fortune in the modern TV era. It fools Brown and a bunch of other athletes into believing that they're far more than an athlete. Mm. You're a six foot nine and can dunk a basketball like no one has ever seen. And before <laughs> and before, and then you conclude you're a top flight TV executive, a thought leader on political issues, an inventor of glass football helmets, an educator, someone who can elim eliminate humble beginnings and Emmett Till's mother because someone scribbled something on your garage door at your second home. Because the American media is broken, eventually Brown's problems will be blamed on CTE. The truth is, Brown is not hard to understand. A dysfunctional childhood, coupled with fame, fortune, and privilege <laughs> in his 20s created the mental meltdown we're witnessing on a daily basis. The meltdown of athletes will soon be as commonplace as the crash of young Hollywood stars. All right, guys, Marcel, let's get us rolling. Yes. Mm. Uh, will television for fortune and fame cause more athletes to flame out like Antonio Brown? No. Um, because at the core of this is not the fame and fortune. It's a broken heart that came from a broken childhood, which we're just seeing now example by Antonio Brown. So I understand what you mean, and there's a lot of me that agrees with what you're saying because you're pouring the cosmetics of fame and fortune to give this fresh new body to this bad engine. And that's what we see when you see guys flame out like this. But you got to also understand the people from the Liberty Cities of the world, the Comptons, the, the Pittsburgh, yeah, East Hills, East Hills of the world don't usually crash and burn because they usually don't even get up in the air. Most of those people are in that situation and it's going to be an eternal situation. So for the one 
in the million that gets out. We're going to see some flame, and we're going to see some that don't. And I have friends who don't. Uh, everyone calls Merkel, but, I, you know. Oh, yeah. He's Still a homie. White. That's right. Jalil's a normal, well-adjusted individual, but he's Urkel to everybody else, but didn't flame out. My point is this. I don't blame the riches or fame because guess what? That gives you your only chance to actually fix that broken heart through what is he doing, Antonio Brown? Therapy. What is Antonio Brown doing now? Actually providing value to his life and to his children's life. Now, hopefully, he can direct that in a more positive nature. But the point is, there's no fixing if he doesn't get from the situation that he is actually coming from. Now he's trying to fix that. But it's, it's a tough place for him to be when he doesn't have the proper guidance and direction. And I'm not blaming the fortunes. Mm -hmm. I'm blaming that broken heart he's still trying to build over. I'll say this. I, I do think more players are, if, if there isn't a better approach to preparation of success for these, these youngsters, there will be a ton more flame outs that take place. Um, I can recall just having a a distorted vision and view of how the world worked in reality because of how gifted I was athletically. Mm -hmm. From the time I was in high school, you know, which is interesting because a little bit before then, you know, I couldn't get a, girl, a cute girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I'm a handsome man. <laughs> now. <laughs> but I wasn't handsome, <laughs> right? So the thing about I couldn't get a cute girlfriend, wasn't, wasn't one of the cool kids, this, that, and the other. Next thing you know, they figure out that I'm running 90-yard touchdowns. I got a 42-inch vertical. You end up being the parade player of the year. I had all this success in, in high school. Then it carried over into college, and it gets worse in college because yeah, yeah. at least you, you're at home, mm. and some of the things that take place in college – are way different than what took place when you were in high school. So you begin to, to really be developed in a way where you're kind of invincible. And then you start adding different things to your resume based upon what your accomplishments are on, on the court or on the playing field. So I started thinking that I was good looking because I had stardom in my dating life. I started thinking that I was a businessman because mm -hmm. I had the finances to finance mm -hmm. a business. Yeah. I started thinking a lot of things outside of what I was supposed to think of. It was taking your eyes off of the prize because you thought you had the prize. Mm -hmm. And then before you realize your eyes were not focused on the prize anymore, now your career was over, and that's exactly how my career ended. Well, I want to go back mm. to, to near the end, and that's a Great. great point. Great. You talk about here dysfunctional childhood, because that's where it all comes from. Bingo. See, because, and I'm going to give you a personal story, because when my sister, rest in peace, she was five and a half years older than me. When she was younger, in school, they thought she was slow, but she wasn't. She just had ADHD. But my parents never diagnosed it. Mm. Because back then, going to the hospital and doing things like that was kind of not Absolutely. what black families did. Mm. So she had to struggle with that her whole life. Sometimes it fluctuated up and down. She couldn't keep a job. But she was a great person. But because she didn't control this when she was at a young age, it manifested itself once she got older. What I see with AB, we're not talking about the physical part. We're talking about the mental things that he mm. continues to do, the up and down. Is it bipolarism? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But it's something there from his childhood, okay? Mm. Now, you couple that with the fact you come from Central Michigan, you have your own issues there, but you're not a big-time star. You come to Pittsburgh, you're behind Heinz Ward, then all of a sudden your stardom grows. I've always said the camera, and you talk about fame, is as addictive as drugs. So now you start to do things because now you're more famous. You feel you're untouchable. So you couple that fame with the money, okay, with having maybe some issues from childhood. Football and sports a lot of times can't separate the two. Mm -hmm. Josh Gordon, sometimes it's better that you get away from the game because if not, you're still being enabled to do the same things. Mm -hmm. So giving football back to some people is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Giving basketball is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to just get away, go get the help that's needed, because to your point, the money is great because he's taking care of his family. But the money is not solving the issues that are deep within mm -hmm. Antonio Brown, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. He comes from a broken home that led to the broken heart that I'm talking about, which 
you're talking about a situation that once it starts to build on itself and you have a fractured foundation, mm -hmm. we all know it's going to sooner or later come crumbling down. Yep. This is just the way it's doing it because of fame and fortune for our own visibility. But imagine Antonio Brown still stuck in the Liberty City with these same issues. It shows itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. We're just now privy to knowing it like this. What did Frederick Douglass say, y'all? It's easier to build strong children than broken to repair man. broken <laughs> men. And look, I'm a broken man, but for whatever reasons and graces and mercies, I was able to put myself in enough positions where that fork in the road kid who I could have went wrong mm -hmm. actually did a lot more right. But I still live with those moments and broken hearted moments when you were growing up because what you expect and what you desire is not your reality. And I love, I love the fact that you say how your career actually comes crumbling down yeah, really, because of you not really. fixing this. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened to me, man. I, I, got, I got to a place where Mike Boyle, world-renowned trainer, said, don't come to work on a red carpet. Huh. And I started to come to work on the red carpet because I was playing through every injury, every situation. Next, Bruce Smith, so what? <laughs> balling, balling, balling. Then one day, you got hit with it. And when you got hit with it, it was hard to come back from it because I was fractured from in here, trying to prove value out here. I had so many friends of the opposite mm. gender. I had so many parties. <laughs> right. I DJed everything, right. still getting double-digit sacks, living a life. And I was only trying to cover up what was broken in here. Mm. We're seeing it right here, and that's why I'm with you. You but, ain't got to give them football back to fix I this. Love your points. The only thing, I think we all, to some degree, are broken. Mm -hmm. but, you know. Things had no one has people you think have the perfect childhood. They really don't. True. Everybody has issues. Then when you throw on to young people, fame and fortune, it creates a deal because most people that have success initially reach the conclusion where well, everything I'm doing must be right. Mm -hmm. You know, why would I be having this success? Right. And then if you throw in a spiritual person, and this will sound contradictory to A.B.'s problem, but he's a spiritual person, talks about God all the time. And the way he interprets things, I've seen a lot of people, oh, my God, I got to, no way God would bless me right. like this mm -hmm. if I were in the wrong or if things were wrong with me. There's no way. And particularly when you say, from what I came from, God blessed me this way. And I see, Le I see LeBron making the same mistake. Oh, my God, I came from all this. No way I could be wrong. I was blessed this and so all this fame and fortune and adulation and all the corporations and because the Pittsburgh Seas, the NFL, those are major corporations that are patting you on the back, patting you on the back. And you're a big star and social media tells you you're a big star and all of it just delays you ever fixing mm. the problems that we're all born with into this world of sin. And for people like me that whose athletic career ended at 21, 22, and then started out with a $5 an hour job out of college, we have to start addressing the problems within ourselves earlier, earlier. which is a good thing, yeah. mm -hmm. in order to have success and to move up. And again, that's why I'm saying, I, I think a lot of guys uh, in professional sports, mm -hmm. but in football, football to me, and I say this with affinity, it's a sport for the broken. Mm. You have to be desperate to me to play football at the highest, highest, highest level. You have to see that as the only thing. I, and e even someone as talented and from a privileged family like Peyton Manning, he saw himself as a football player, and that's why he had so much success. Ray Lewis, right? the way to give for me to make football, it's for the desperate. People like me, it's like, well, hell, I made Good. Go work for my father at yeah, the bar. Right, right. I, I may <laughs> go be a sports writer. It's easy, but but these football players, I, it's well, direct parallel. Boxers, yeah, same oh, thing. Oh, yeah. Because if you chart a lot of the boxers, whether they're international or they come from you know Poverty. Central America, pro, w w a Central City, yeah. a lot of the same stories, are, you know, they mirror each other. Okay, this was my only way out. I had to be able to get it out. I had to fight my way out the system. And because of all that trauma that they've had when they were younger, when they get to the big stage, and again, we're not categorizing all of them, mm -hmm. but we see a lot of the same stories in boxing that we see in football, particularly from minorities who are in these um, situations. 
that they flame out or something happens during the course of their career over and over again, and you can't pinpoint why until you circle back to around to where they, they they'll tell you the story. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you because it's on full display. Sometimes we don't want to hear it because you're, we look at you up here That's what's most important. and we don't see yep. that you've been telling us we had a problem all the time. Nobody cares to look back. And that's the biggest issue that, that a guy like Antonio Brown has to deal with and why this is something that can be prevalent or is prevalent with players is that once those, once those cracks begin to show, once those issues begin to surface, nobody wants to hear about it. They're going to replace you with another player. Mm. They're going to cut you. Your roster spot is gone. We're just not going to deal with it. So here. dealing with the issue is re your removal. It's not dealing with listening to where the problems come from, and that's what makes it a volatile issue. Whitlock and Wiley, TJ Husmanzada is back with us. Let's move to Urban Meyer, whose future has become a subject of intense speculation in recent weeks. According to Stephen A. Smith, Meyer is interested in the Cowboys head coaching job. The coach also has a close relationship with Browns owner Jimmy Haslam, and reportedly there's a strong possibility he could end up as the Browns coach if Freddie Kitchens gets the boot. Mm. All right, the question here is, better job for Urban Meyer, Browns or Cowboys? Browns, the one you said first, Browns. Lower expectations. This was a 7-9 ball club that may win six games this year, seven games max. And the expectations are low, but the roster talent is pretty high. You go to Dallas, they're a couple years removed from being a 13-3 team, and everyone is sitting there talking about what you have to do, Super Bowl or bust, and Jerry Jones is in your ear. For what? You get more bang for your buck if you're a Cleveland Brown coach, and more importantly, if you do fail, it's Cleveland. Belichick even failed there. So what, you can fall back on that soft mastery. This is a no-brainer to me. Go to Cleveland. Man, I can go both ways with this, but I'm going to Cleveland Browns as well. Mm. Cleveland, they haven't been to the playoffs since 2002. And so their expectations are as such. We haven't had a winning season or been to the playoffs in such a long time that we would take anything. And you look at the, the roster. It's unbelievable. Skill players, top two in the league. Defensive line, top two or three in the league. Mm. Secondary, very good. I'm not, running backs, top two run. I, they're the best running back corner in the league with uh, Chubb and Kareem Hunt. And so I'm not a fan of the offensive line, and I'm not a fan of Baker. But with a coach like Urban Meyer, right. maybe that changes with Baker. Well, I probably lean y'all's way, but I'm going to argue the other side uh, for the sake of being interesting. <laughs> Look. TV. Marcellus loves to say pre past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. Yeah. The Browns' behavior over the last 20 years pretty much says that's Belichick failed there. Yeah. Belichick failed there. Belichick failed there. Mm. Urban Meyer can fail there. Now, obviously the last 20 years, the Cowboys' behavior, uh, but if you go look, uh, Jason Garrett just got nine years. Nine years. I think that in that same time span, the Browns have probably had seven coaches. True. And so True. you got a very good roster in Dallas. Uh, I think you can run out. If it doesn't work, you can, Jerry got in the way. Jerry screwed it up. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think I sat here and heard him on Cowherd's couch a month ago, two ago. He didn't say – the Browns are the call you have to take. <laughs> he said the Cowboys were the call you had to take, and he said that for a reason. Yeah, uh, look, I'm going to be completely honest with y'all. If y'all really want to know where he's going, you're talking to the right guy. Don't forget, and I couldn't say this fully when I was at my former workplace at ESPN, y'all know who told everyone where Jim Harbaugh was going? Yours truly. I knew that. I have a friend who's a recruiter, and he works high-level recruiting. These things are handled behind the scenes, as you guys all know, before they are made public. They have to work out the deal. I mean, the Uncle Dennis's of the world have to get involved with recruiters to make this happen. So if y'all really want to know, you're looking at the right guy. And I will make that phone call to try to give us a lead up. Before when I did that and I told everybody where Jim Harbaugh was going, people were like, that's not your lane, that's not what you do. But I know the intel that goes with this. If you want to just look at what a recruiter would want out of a situation, I think that there's more power to pull for Urban Meyer without resistance in Cleveland than in Dallas. In Dallas, I think it would take Jerry Jones to concede some power. Is Jerry Jones going to do that? I doubt it. If he hits rock bottom, which the Cowboys have, the only thing about Cleveland that concerns me 
is, and it's a big concern. You got to play Pittsburgh twice, and you got to play Baltimore twice. Mm. They're going to be good every year for years to come. And you go to the NFC East, you get to play Washington, yeah. you get to play the Giants, yeah. and you got to deal with the Eagles. And, and so from that perspective, the division with the, that the Browns are in in the AFC North is a lot more complicated. I think they're better South. quarterbacks in the NFC East if you really want to talk about trajectory and building up. Lamar Jackson's in the AFC That's North. That's one. Go, go after that. The ben Roethlisberger it's, coming back at 38, maybe. The, the, the Steelers Beagles are about to draft Burrow. Cincinnati, probably. where? But the Steelers are always good on defense. And, and so that's tough sledding in the AFC North. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval ratings for Kirk Cousins. You know who? Oh. First, give me a Christmas present. Oh. Make, a, oh. make Marcellus big dummy of the day. <laughs> Man, I sure hate to do this, but you got to get that work, Douglas. <laughs> How you gonna sit up here and say, you don't want to show up to work like you showing up on the red carpet. <laughs> what you wanna do, show up like you laying the carpet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm walking down the red carpet, playboy. That ain't what he said, though. <laughs> All right, let's I talk some you. Kirk Cousins. Say something different. Who was terrible last night, falling to 0 and 9 mm. on Monday Night Football. Mm. As the Vikings lost to the Packers, even still, Minnesota has already clinched a playoff spot. Right. Marcellus, do you think Cousins and the Vikings make any noise in the postseason? I do, actually. With Dalvin Cook coming back from that shoulder injury, that running game gets going. Look, they played last night with one hand behind their back without Dalvin Cook. So you get them into the fold, and they get some of that mojo going on defense. I think Kirk Cousins is enough. I think he's a franchise quarterback. Who can they beat in the NFC play postseason? Seattle. Try, oh, yeah. All they right, ain't going to play them, though. <laughs> check. Seattle. <laughs> right? Check. Got one. I was checkmate, but it's check. Momentum. That wasn't bad. There you go. Start All right, no, up. I don't think they make any noise. I think they get beat in the first round of the playoffs. Mm. Uh, the Vikings and Kirk Cousins are both overrated. All right, Uncle Jimmy. Yeah. You got a take on uh, Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings. The drag. <laughs> Paint <laughs> nicotine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. I see what I see what the problem is. <laughs> this is the reason we can't get Uncle Jimmy paid. <laughs> Why? Right here, because you always trying to set the value at what somebody else is worth. <laughs> mm, mm. Now see, out the way I figured, right about now you the only person working at Fox that's getting paid what they weigh. <laughs> now you out here working with me for pennies on the dollar. <laughs> now look at Douglas. He gotta put the franchise tag on me. Mm. No, he put the clearance tag on me. <laughs> now look, we all know. Hands half down. Off. You bottom half line, off. case half closed. <laughs> Uncle Jimmy, the MVP of this show. <laughs> oh really? Now have we or have we not already clinched the division? Yeah. Are okay. we or are we not going to the Super Bowl? Yeah. All right. But yet and still, I still gotta work tonight. <laughs> you do. But you know what? You keep it up. Just wait till free agency get here. Because oh. you know Mike Wilbon got them deep pockets. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you something. He don't like you nearly as much as you think he do. <laughs> Look, I got something else for you. How does this sound for you? How does this sound? Colin, Joey, and Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> huh? Doesn't have a ring. Bottom though. line, case goes. Vikings got just what the hell they paid for. <laughs> they got the cousin. <laughs> you know when the two fine sisters is gone and all they got left is the cousin? And you go, the, hey. Yeah, I, <laughs> I heard you had a Kirk Cousin song. Get yeah, well, anyway, look, I, did, I know how the Viking yeah. fans feel. Let me tell you how this. <clears throat> Kirk's nuts are roasting <laughs> on an open fire. <laughs> Cause what? the Vikings lost another game. <laughs> Minnesota had giant thoughts <laughs> and their eyes were all aglow. <laughs> and now they find it hard to sleep tonight. <laughs> Cause they know that Santa's on his way. <laughs> and there's no more quarterbacks or goodies on his sleigh. <laughs> so every Vikings fan is gonna cry. <laughs> Cause they know that Kirk Cousins will be here until the day they die. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm offering this simple phrase <laughs> to Vikings fans from 1 to 92. <laughs> Although it's been said many times, many ways, Kirk Cousins sucks. <laughs> sucks to be you. 
<laughs> Merry Christmas. Hey, I oh, agree with man. that. I've oh, got Kirk six. Cousins at a 52 <coughs> scout team. I drop his job performance all the way down to a 13. 52 scout team Kirk Cousins. Oh, I got love for him. Since the last hey, time we did him, I had to move up his job performance. Huge primetime win over the Dallas way. Cowboys. People forget about that. So. Got him at a role player. All right, quarterback. quarterback and a, the internet agrees with me. 49% scout team, 35% dumpster fire.